Welcome back to our viewers to our conference, a very good conference so far on environmental justice and climate equality. This morning we had three outstanding speakers and uh, we are now very much looking forward to our afternoon speakers. Uh, I wanted to just simply mention that uh, how heart sick we are on the East Coast about the news of uh, Ida's uh, impact uh, all across from the south all the way up to the northeast of the U.S. and in particular how sorry we are about the loss of lives and the hardship and suffering that millions of people are undergoing at this time. So our afternoon program begins with uh, a presentation by Professor Radislav Dimitrov, who is a professor of international relations at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, Canada. He participated in the United Nations climate change negotiations on the delegation of European Union between 20, 2009 and 2018. He helped negotiate the Paris Agreement on climate, polit, excuse me, on climate change and served as the EU political strategist and co-chair of the European Union Task Force on Political Communication. Pre previously, he was consultant on climate diplomacy for the World Business Council for Sustainable Development and the Global Alliance of Land Transportation Industries for which he designed their political strategy for a transition to sustainable transport. Professor Dimitrov's academic research on global climate governance, diplomacy, and international institutions is published in journals such as International Studies Quarterly, International Studies Review, Global Environmental Politics, Review of Policy Research, and the Journal of Environment and Development. It is my pleasure now to introduce uh, to you Professor, uh, Professor uh, Dimitrov, uh, Radislav, I'm sorry, Professor Radislav Dimitrov. Thank you so much for being with us today, Professor. Hello. Um, thank you very much for this very kind introduction, Professor Mahmoudi. Um, can everyone hear me? The sound is coming through okay? Yes, yes. Wonderful. Um, it's a really real pleasure to be able to contribute uh, to this very important conference. Um, today, I'm here to speak about uh, several very important themes that uh, really uh, relate to a defining challenge that humankind faces today. Um, obviously, the context is that climate change is really the most uh, consequential and unprecedented global problem that affects all parts of the planet. And in the history of humankind, we really do not have uh, experience with something that affects all societies at the same time. Um, we know that um, natural disasters are increasing in their severity, in their frequency. Uh, this is a photograph from uh, last summer uh, when 11 of the United States were literally burning. Um, we have evidence that ice is melting very rapidly on the uh, ice caps and in glaciers uh, a lot faster than, than, uh, than scientists thought. Um, and sea level is rising and is not affecting only developing countries. Uh, this is a photograph from Venice that has been inundated by the rising waters a number of times in the past years. Um, so this um, is really the context that explains why governments have invested a tremendous amount of political energy to discuss the problem and devise common solutions to climate change. Um, today, um, what I'd like to do is discuss 
what is now the key agreement at the international level to combat climate change, and that is the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, negotiated in 2015. Um, I also want to give the audience a sense of where things are now with this treaty, uh, what is the degree of political support that it has received, as well as what governments are actually doing to implement it. Um, this is somewhat related to a much broader issue um, about global political, financial and economic trends that we are observing that are somewhat parts of the implementation of the Paris Agreement, but also go beyond that because it's not just governments who are acting, but there are important developments in the corporate world. And all of these together really constitute what can be described as the early phase of a global transition to a clean economy. And without trying to be melodramatic, but if this trend continues, this transition will be one of the most profound transformations of human society that is unraveling at an astonishingly fast speed you know, from a historical perspective. Um, what I also want to emphasize early on is that some of the information that I am bringing with this presentation um, is not widely available elsewhere. Um, I have indeed had the privilege to uh, be behind closed doors of where the key treaties were negotiated. Um, and I want to signal to you that governments have been ahead of the game for many years now. Uh, compared to the, the level of public understanding or public awareness of these issues, governments are really far, far ahead. Um, and there are certain things to be said about the Paris Agreement uh, in particular that the public still doesn't quite understand. So I'm going to bring some of this information from behind the closed doors. Uh, here, obviously, you can see some photographs from uh, my participation. The photograph on the right is from 2009, uh, when I first uh, began representing the European Union at the Copenhagen Conference, uh, which was one of the many disasters in climate diplomacy. Um, so let's go to Paris in December of 2015. Uh, this is one of the main, one of the two main plenary halls that uh, were created as part of a whole village that was constructed by the French government uh, for this conference, which brought 40,000 participants from around the world. Uh, it was one of the biggest uh, international diplomacy events in history. About 20,000 of those participants were government delegates and the rest were from civil society, the corporate world, and the mass media. Uh, it was indeed a historic conference. It was really um, a wonderful experience to be able to see history in the making. Um, many things happened in the two weeks of the event. Uh, there was the high level segment where heads of states came the first two days. And here you see some photographs of um, Angela Merkel uh, and Vladimir Putin, um, Justin Trudeau, Prime Minister of Canada. Um, and um, I took one of the two of those photographs uh, personally. Uh, one of them is with uh, John Kerry, who at that time was the US Secretary of State. Um, and was head of the American delegation, speaking here with the Canadian Environment Minister. Um, and um, as we now know, the conference turned out to be a political success where for the first time in a very long time, they were able to actually agree and launch a new agreement. Um, that was not clear, however, until the very end. Um, literally until the last hours of the conference, it wasn't certain that uh, all governments will accept this treaty. 
Um, and there had to be consensus. The rules of the game are that, is that even if one country opposes, they hold a veto power, and it doesn't matter which country that is. Um, in the last hours of the conference, um, they ended up basically postponing the event with several hours. Uh, I was, you know, hanging out with my colleagues from Europe, you know, a few ministers there that you see on the photograph. And we really didn't know what was the reason why the, the event was not starting till the final session. Um, and it turned out that it had to do with a paragraph that was in the text and that you see on the screens here. Uh, it had to do with the obligations of the industrialized world um, in reducing their emissions. And um, it turned out that in the last minute, the American delegation uh, pulled the trump card and said, we will only accept the treaty if we change one word in this paragraph. And the word is shell. In international law, shell has a very, very strong binding power. It means that there is a strong legal obligation to act and fulfill obligations. And uh, at the insistence of the US delegation, this word was changed to should which changes profoundly the meeting, the meaning of the legal text, because now it is not so legally binding and it is pretty much voluntary to uh, achieve emission reductions. That was the political price to pay. Uh, the European Union, as well as the island states, which have always wanted the strongest possible international agreement. They very reluctantly accepted that change as the price to pay to actually have a treaty accepted by everyone. And in a list of irony, um, after that, the American um, President Donald Trump basically said, we're not going to participate in the Paris Agreement, which is something that you see in diplomacy in various issues internationally where the US undermines uh, the text of certain agreements and then steps out and doesn't participate at all, um, leaving everybody else with a weaker agreement where everybody else would have preferred a stronger one. Um, eventually, uh, the, the agreement was accepted. Um, and now we have the first international agreement in history that actually has uh, obligations on all countries, including in the developing world, particularly China and Japan which are among the top emitters of greenhouse gases. The official goal of the treaty is to hold the temperature increase to well below two degrees centigrade and to pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5%, uh, sorry, 1.5 degrees. Uh, this exact wording was a matter of compromise to accommodate the insistence of 106 governments out of 193, 106 governments said two degrees is way too high. It's already going to be catastrophic. We do need to limit the temperature rise to 1.5 degrees. Uh, however, all of the industrialized countries were opposed to that, including the European Union. And um, Inside the EU, uh, the strategizing was basically how to come up with quote unquote creative language to bow to the demands of the those 106 countries without actually making 1.5 the official goal of the treaty. And therefore, we ended up with the text to pursue efforts in that direction. Whether we achieve it or not uh, it, it is another issue. Um, one of the weaknesses says of the treaty is that um, it does not pin a quantitative target for emission reductions. It speaks about stabilizing emissions or peaking of emissions, and not by a particular date, but as soon as possible, which is an incredibly elastic, loose concept. It doesn't really mean anything. Um, and Please feel free to ask how we ended up with that uh, goal, given that so many governments said, no, we need very strict quantitative targets for emission reductions. The national commitments of governments to act 
are very complicated in the treaty. On the one hand, every government of a sovereign country has almost unlimited freedom to determine what they want to do domestically. What kind of policies in place, what kind of goals in place, what kind of targets, etc. But at the same time, it's not a complete laissez-faire laissez treaty because there's a very strong legal obligation to actually have a policy plan in place. What is much more important, and this is where virtually all citizens around the world are completely um, oblivious of this, is a provision in the treaty for which the European Union and the island states fought very, very hard that has to do with policy progression. To put it in simple words, it means that once the government jumps into the treaty and declares a national plan of action, they come under obligation to update this plan every five years. Crucially, Every consecutive plan has to be more ambitious than the previous one. Which means that governments who enter the treaty through ratification are find themselves in a long-term path of ever accelerating climate policy. And that is what progression is. Uh, to give you a, an example of how consequential this provision is, the Canadian government has been notorious for dragging its feet in coming with strong national domestic plans for emission reductions. Now they are um, trying to, do, uh, to take more ambitious action, but still it is criticized uh, from a number of corners. However, Canada now is essentially locked into a process where every five years, they have to make their policy stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger, which really leads to a clean economy eventually. So to summarize, the key provisions are, every government has uh, to have a mandatory national plan. Um, they do have complete freedom and policy discretion on what is the content of that plan. But progression kicks in, the so-called ratcheting up mechanism essentially suggests that we're going to be seeing stronger and stronger policy over time, both domestically and internationally. The one gap in the, uh, in the treaty that was not finalized and is still not finalized today is Article 6. Article 6 has to do with global carbon markets. In order to have a, um, a global carbon market, you have to fix a carbon price. That is a very controversial issue. And hopefully, the next, during the next round of negotiations that will take place this year, in December in Glasgow, Scotland. This will be addressed again. We'll have to see what happens there. Article six is important because if you don't have a carbon price and a global carbon market, you cannot engage in emissions trading. And we don't have to get more technical here, but I just wanna signal that that is the main thing to be still negotiated. So, what are the impacts of this treaty? It's indeed very complicated. Um, very clearly, there is widespread political support among governments. Already at the conference, um, everybody lined up basically during the last night of the conference to express their support. And much more importantly, virtually every country has now ratified this agreement except the, one that you, the ones that you see on the screen, uh, including Turkey, Sudan, Yemen, South Sudan, Yemen, Iraq, and Iran. Together, however, those countries account 
for a mere 4% of global emissions, which means that 96% of global emissions are in countries whose governments have ratified the agreement and therefore have accepted legal obligations under it. That is very, very impressive. There are actually very few treaties in international law in any issue area that can, um, that can claim the same. What is equally important and absolutely crucial for, for people to, to observe is that around the world in the past decade, there is a clear pattern of policy developments towards the clean economy, towards clean energy. The proliferation of these policies by governments is absolutely phenomenal, very steady and also very accelerating. Take a look at the global map that shows how many countries in 2007 had climate legislation. What that means really is um, domestic um, policy plans that were approved by parliaments, Congress, etc. Um, and you see that they were very, very few countries like that. Um, some major ones, including China, uh, all of the European Union, um, the EU has always been pretty much the, the pioneer in this, um, but relatively few countries. Only five years later, and five years is a very, very short uh, time, the map looked considerably different. Canada was the only country that went in the opposite direction and actually dropped its existing plan. Um, but the countries with climate legislation increased. And then another five years later, in 2017, you see that most of the countries that do have sizable emissions, with the exception of the United States and Australia, had um, this, this legislation in place. So clearly what we're seeing is within a very short historical time, actually, let me go back here. Within a very short historical time, um, we have a, a remarkable spread of government policies and they're all converging in the same direction. Obviously, some of them are lip service, but not, uh, not all of them. Now, what about actual emissions? Because the policies may not have an impact. Um, it's a mixed bag. Uh, there are charts that show that the number of countries have increased their emissions, including China, and China is the biggest emitter. But a rem an impressive number of countries also have lower emissions than, had lower emissions in 2017 than in 2005. Uh, this is a snapshot from a publication that I uh, just put out there recently. Um, and many of those countries have either stabilized their emissions or have actually managed to decrease them. Now that is uh, again, very impressive. Uh, and uh, it is something that would have been um, implausible uh, 15 or 20 years ago. Um, let's now take a look at some of the most recent policy developments that are quite exciting actually. This is a big one. Virtually all of the major, each major economy has declared that they want to decarbonize their economy by the middle of the century. 2050, all of them except for China that said 2060. Uh, that is really signals an absolutely profound, profound global transformation. Um, 18 of those 20 countries also have, uh, 18 of the 20 largest economies also have carbon pricing schemes in place, which suggests that they actually are serious about uh, decarbonizing. Uh, here, the notable exception is Australia that doesn't. Um, many cars also recently, within the last year actually, declared that they want to replace all of their regular vehicles on the roads with electric vehicles, again, by the middle of the century. And those include some industrialized countries, uh, such as the United Kingdom, France, Japan, 
and some of the Scandinavian countries. Uh, we see that the el electrification of transportation is actually unraveling with surprising speed, where now all of the major automakers are very, very busy developing electric vehicles and saying that within five years, they're going to have you know, each of them an average of five to 10 new models that are purely electric. That is really quite significant. Um, some concrete examples. Um, the EU plans to have climate neutrality by 2050, which means that they will have zero net emissions of greenhouse gases by that time. Um, in the meantime, they uh, recently increased yet once again their ambition for 2030 to binding 55% emission reductions. And there are some other uh, numbers there that provide some more detail. Um, what is the reason why Europe has moved in that direction in the last, particularly in the last 20 years? Well, the first one really is that um, the European continent is one of the very badly hit areas of the world uh, that are suffering the consequences of climate change. Uh, this photograph behind uh, is just one of the many illustrations. Um, that translates into a very strong public awareness and public concern with the problem. But equally importantly, European planners and, and leaders are seeing the climate problem as a very important economic opportunity. Because they think that if they make the, the transition to a clean economy, that is going to strengthen the European economy, uh, modernize it, and make it much more competitive. And in 2017, uh, in one of the many statements of the European Council, they said the Paris Agreement is a key element for the modernization of the industry and, and the economy. Now, to some of you, this may sound, yeah, that's nothing new about that. We've heard that before. But I was witnessing the early uh, years when the Europeans brought that argument for the first time. And this was approximately 15 years ago. And when they said climate policy can actually strengthen the economy, other delegations would look around and say, uh huh, excuse us. Because at that time, the conventional economic wisdom is that the climate policy is disastrous for the economy. It's, it's prohibitively expensive. It's going to wreck the economy and uh, we'll lose jobs. So that was the conventional wisdom embraced by everyone. And the Europeans continued in that, you know, apparently crazy logic, and they started pro providing information and they solicited studies. And the main study that came uh, as a result was the Stern report in 2007 that basically said that the cost of climate policy is not that high, and in fact might actually be negative, meaning that it might climate policy might actually bring benefits to the economy. At the same time, South Korea started tabling the same arguments in the UN negotiations. And then now, eventually, even Canada and the United States, you know, are often speaking about this kind of economic opportunity. So the economic motivation in Europe in particular is that they uh, expect an annual increase of GDP as a result of climate policy by 2%. They also think that by 2050, they will have reduced their oil imports and saved two to three trillion euro, which is a, obviously a very sizable amount of, of money. And in addition to that, because climate policy reduces local air pollution, that also alleviates some health problems in the population. And the, the savings from the healthcare system alone are projected to be 200 billion euro, and that is, I believe, per year. So that is also very, very um, 
significant and difficult to ignore. Um, what is also interesting is that this rhetoric and discourse about the economic opportunity that climate policy provides has been embraced by other major players, including in Japan, uh, where the new prime minister last year said that uh, responding to climate change is not a restraint or no longer a restraint on economic growth. Um, that um, if you take measures against climate change, you can actually bring economic growth. So what is actually the clean economy that now some societies are building? Um, it is essentially uh, an economy based, based on several pillars. One of them is energy efficiency, which means in very lay language, do not waste energy. Um, that is actually a major front line in the policy world because the, the amount of energy completely wasted is atrocious. It is atrocious. According to one estimate, 45% of all energy used in the United States is unnecessarily used, meaning that it doesn't contribute to any quality of life or to the economy. It is basically money thrown in the wind. The second pillar of a clean economy is renewable energy. And this is where we have alternative sources of energy, the sun, the wind, the tidal waves, geothermal energy, and, and biomass. Um, part of this transition is moving to alternative transportation. And ultimately, really, we're talking about decarbonizing society. The benefits of a clean economy is, are uh, also known as co-benefits are first of all, energy security. And that means political independence from volatile regions such as the Middle East, where so much the, of the oil comes from. Um, and that also means political and economic independence. The second major benefit is industrial innovation that is stimulated um, through the new technologies uh, that are climate friendly. Economic competitiveness um, uh, is increasing because um, exports, for example, increase. Um, Japan was the first country to produce hybrid uh, cars uh, in the early 21st century. Um, today, Tesla is leading the way in the electric vehicle world. Um, you know, obviously, this is about um, competition as well. And interestingly, uh, many jobs are expected to um, be created in the new sectors of the new economy. Uh, we spoke about the health benefits, so we'll skip that. In September of last year, China made um, a completely unexpected announcement uh, during um, a, a very sparsely, a really sparsely attended meeting of the UN General Assembly. Mm. And um, the Chinese premier, premier announced out of the blue that China is actually going to be carbon neutral by 2060. And so they signaled that they're decarbonizing their society. So let's take a look at the, the major, the biggest emitter of greenhouse gases. Um, their official goal for many years now has been to stabilize their emissions by 2030, which means that they will not allow emissions to increase beyond the year 2000, 2030. At the same time, they, uh, they are committed to in reducing their carbon intensity by 60 to 65 percent, which means cutting the amount of carbon released in the atmosphere per unit of industrial production. Yes, their overall emissions are continuing to increase, but uh, given the size and the growth of their economy, what they're actually putting in the atmosphere as uh, you know, per unit of industrial production is actually considerably lower today. And the new goal is to have carbon neutrality, which means zero net carbon emissions by 2060. Um, curiously, in 2018, China made the dramatic 
move to change their constitution and now officially the constitution says that they're building an ecological civilization by 2035. Our experience with China has been that uh, they are very slow to make public announcements but once they announce something publicly we can consider it a done deal. They have a sterling record of fulfilling their international promises. Um, the photograph on the previous slide um, showed a vast field covered with um, solar panels in China. Uh, indeed, China is the undisputed leader in the world when it comes to renewable energy investments. Uh, their investments have grown very steadily since 2004. Um, and that is part of a global trend um, of, um, of increased investments in clean energy. If you break it down to different regions, you will see that particularly in Europe and Asia, um, these investments are growing trem tremendously. I think now that the United States is trying to catch up, uh, and I think that they eventually they will. <clears throat> the global investments in green energy are $2.6 trillion. Um, and again, China uh, leads the way. Um, individually, the United States uh, is next to Japan. The European Union as a whole is number second after China, but obviously the individual countries have a much lower share. Um, so let's now uh, uh, stay focused on this realm beyond the government, the corporate world, and look at the financial trends on a global scale. Last year was pivotal because for the first time in history, the investments in renewable energy actually exceeded in global investments in the oil industry. Clearly, this was precipitated by the pandemic, the lockdown, that led to a dramatic drop in the demand for energy and oil. But that doesn't explain why renewable energy investments continue to increase during that same time. Um, Renewables are increasing while oil investments are decreasing at the same time by a dramatic one third in a matter of several years. At the same time, governments are giving less money to the oil industry and the coal industry. Government subsidies in the G20 for fossil fuels have been slashed by half, again, in a matter of five years. And it's not just governments that are pulling the plug. Oil companies are uh, basically retreating. They have cut a quarter million jobs between 2014 and 2016. Um, a couple of years ago, um, a very comprehensive report came out um, that um, essentially uh, points out that now government development agencies are actually restricting the public finances of coal in particular, not so much oil, but coal in particular. Um, consider that the um, European Investment Bank has declared that they are not going to, um, they're going to refuse any funding to any project that involves fossil fuels. And at the same time, the bank is going to spend $1 trillion before 2030 on the green economy, on green energy. So in conclusion, when we look around what's happening around the world today, um, we see that we live in a rapidly evolving socio-political environment. Asia and Europe in particular are committed to build a clean economy. That is not under question. 
there. Investment patterns confirm a global shift away from fossil fuels. And a lot of this is happening for economic reasons because more and more governments are seeing the economic wisdom of building a clean economy. And the Paris Agreement is just one piece in that picture, but it is fundamental and I must emphasize that all of this is happening partly because the international negotiations on climate change were a place where governments could exchange ideas and information. And it changed the calculus. It changed the considerations that governments had in policy planning. Even when the climate talks were failing year after year before Paris, indirectly climate diplomacy still was a vehicle for that global transformation that we are seeing more clearly today. Um, and, and my prediction is that this is not a reversible trend anymore. That it is just a matter of time um, and that oil and coal markets will continue to shrink because more and more governments have really made up their minds and they're plowing ahead. With this, I'd like to thank you for your attention um, and I'm very happy to um, answer any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Dimitrov, for your very informative presentation. Um, and I'd like the viewers to know that they can either, um, well, ideally, I think if you could go to the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and type in your questions for uh, Dr. Dimitrov. But I see that we have a hand up by Professor Williston, please. So thanks for that very informative talk, uh, Radoslav. I love that a lot. Um, I wonder if I, so I have, I have a couple of questions there. Uh, I'll ask them as distinct questions, although I do think they're related. The first is that, um, you know, if you, if you look at some independent uh, number crunchers, like for example, the uh, climate action track or a carbon brief, um, that, you know, they suggest that um, we're going to be somewhere between 2.4 and 2.9 degrees Celsius, given current um, uh, national contributions. And I think in some of those calculations, they're also figuring in sort of likely projections about, about ratcheting up as well. Um, so in other words, uh, even, even if the, 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 the Paris commitments are adhered to by many of the major players, we're still looking at something like, like, like three degrees. So, so, so what do you think of those analyses? I guess that's the first question. The second it has to do, you mentioned Canada. So I have a question about Canada since I'm from there. Um, now, the, 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 the current target is to have uh, 40 to 45% emissions reduction relative to the 2005 baseline. Um, and, um, and they believe they can get that. Um, but the only way they can get it is, is, if they, is if they count our forests as carbon sinks. Um, and that's because they wanna continue to expand the tar sands in Alberta. Um, so I guess my question is, what do you think, my second question is, what do you think of the legitimacy of uh, sort of accounting tricks like that, right? Whereby Canada gets to claim all this extra credit for just for having big forests. That's right. Those are great questions. Thank you very much for, for raising them. Um, let me start with the second one. Uh, the um, It's very simple. Uh, I don't uh, believe the Canadian government. Um, they have a very long record. I mean, not the Canadian government, but the Canadian governments. In the past decades, there is a remarkably consistent sterling record of lies. They have had a series of grandiose national policy plans. And we know that virtually until 2015, nobody has moved a finger to actually try to do anything about those policy plans. It's not an accusation. It's an observation that everyone who has looked into it will make their books written about it. I think that the particularly the Canada's uh, policy record is the most abysmal one. I think that personally, I have more respect for Saudi Arabia because Saudi Arabia says we're all about oil. We want fossil fuels, we'll stick with them. That is integrity. And that is also open honesty. 
right? It is so much more um, respectable than saying, oh, we need to be the build a clean economy and we need to move away from fossil fuels and then doing business just as usual. Um, and so um, I am basically have um, pretty much uh, maintained an eye on Canadian policies just out of obligation. I don't have any hopes uh, in the foreseeable future for Canada. I think it's, uh, uh, it's a shame. Um, the second uh, question that you raised um, is, well, just, just to add one illustration to this, um, just as Canada was releasing these grandiose plans and were saying, oh, we're going to, you know, after the pandemic, we're going to uh, use this as an opportunity, you know, to put more money into the renewables, et cetera, et cetera. They actually gave massive amounts of money to the oil industry last year as part of the economic recovery after the pandemic. And if you look at the ratio of how much money went to the oil industry versus the renewable energy in Canada, it is five to one. And that is exactly the same ratio, but reversed in China. In China last year, during the pandemic, spent five times more on renewable energy than they did on coal and, and other fossil fuels. So again, always, you know, it's useful to look at the actual data uh, and to ignore essentially what politicians are saying. The second question has to do with um, had to do with the uh, very very alarming projections that um, even if governments now are doing everything that they are promising, that, that would still is expected to lead to nearly three degrees temperature rise by the end of the century, way beyond 1.5 or 2 degrees. And scientists will tell us that 3 degrees is nothing other than apocalyptic. So that clearly is a source of great concern. Uh, and it will have to be addressed. Uh, and this is where the hopes are pinned on the progression elements of the Paris Agreement, where we hope that governments will continue to increase their policy ambition, just like the EU did a few months ago, uh, and went from 40% to 55% emission cuts by 2030. If the EU, China, Japan, India, and hopefully the United States continue to increase their policy ambition, that is certainly going to help. What I want to emphasize in very strong terms is that the environmental effectiveness of any policy is always going to lag behind the policy efforts. And it's not just climate change. You know, zone depletion during the 20th century, when they created this very strong treaty, the Montreal Protocol on Zone Depletion, even then in the 1980s, they knew very well that even if immediately all governments stop all of the industrial substances that deplete the ozone layer, it would take up to 100 years for the ozone levels to actually go back to normal up in the stratosphere. Because that is the, the unavoidable natural cycle. It's the momentum of the, of the ecosystem that makes it unavoidable. The time will pass between the policy in place and implemented fully and the actual environmental results. So that will really have to be communicated every single time we talk about climate policy so that the public is educated and we have a particular responsibility for that. And that is also why the fact that we are expecting three degrees temperature rise with current policies in place is not evidence that the current policy is failing or that the Paris Agreement is um, it's not good because that might lead people to say, oh, forget about the Paris Agreement. We're not, not even implement it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Could I do a very quick follow up? Of course. Yeah. So I, I agree totally oh, with you about the insincerity of the of the Canadian government. Um, and I'm <laughs> and I'm glad to hear you say that, frankly. Um, so but if I, I wonder if you could address just the one thing I did ask about forests. Do you think do you think using forests the way Canada is to the degree that Canada is, is just a fancy accounting trick? 
for emissions reduction or is there is 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 it legitimate as far as you're concerned i think it is both uh you know it, it can be used as a trick to avoid actually cutting emissions in industrial sectors but it is also true that preserving an increase in the forest cover actually does decrease emissions sorry it doesn't decrease emissions it reduces carbon in the atmosphere because forests are carbon sinks and therefore i do think that forest policy is a legitimate type of climate policy uh, and if you look around the world, there are many examples. Uh, New Zealand, for example, for many decades now, they have prohibited the cutting of any natural forest. You can only log in plantations in New Zealand. Uh, China is very busy, uh, you know, with number one in the world in plantations. Um, and so, uh, yeah, preserving forests is a good thing. I, I, I think it's a legitimate effort. I uh, salute that. Um, and. Um, it's also fair to say that Canada is not the only country that is trying to slip out of emission reductions by working on forests. Uh, Norway, for example, uh, has very ambitious policy in place, uh, but um, they but their work on forests is very much part of the same picture. Thank you. So we have a question from the audience. This is from Anthony Vance, who says. Uh, thank you for an extremely coherent presentation covering a lot of ground very clearly. I have been skeptical for some time about carbon pricing. I wonder about the elasticity of demand when so many energy uses are for things that people feel are essential with, in their view, little room for decreases in consumption, so cooling and heating of homes, driving to work, etc. You mentioned that there are approximately 20 countries that have such systems. Has there emerged evidence demonstrating that demand is actually significantly impacted by carbon pricing? If so, by how much and how would a global system for carbon pricing work? I don't know. <laughs> I literally don't know. We should ask economists. It's not my field. I would be very happy to entertain questions, particularly um, about the global politics of climate change and the interaction of countries at the international level. Uh, the, 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 the diplomatic efforts to construct agreements. Um, I have always felt out of my elements when it comes to carbon pricing, for instance, which really is about economics. Uh, and therefore, um, I, uh, I, I do not want to tread that water. Okay, I think, uh, Dr. Seaman, did you have a question? I do. Um, so actually, that it comes back to um, the international agreements and some of the rhetoric that we hear from governments. So you mentioned earlier in your talk that a lot of governments are kind of ahead of the game in terms of climate change, but quite often um, that isn't matched by the rhetoric that they then use, particularly to their national audiences versus to the international audience. Um, so could you talk a little bit about that mismatch that we often see? Certainly, yeah. That's a great question. Thank you for raising it. Uh, one very good example is climate science. Um, I have participated in very, uh, in many meetings where climate science was discussed internationally by government delegations. I participated in some, also in some meetings of the uh, IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, where the same government diplomats are in attendance. And let me tell you, even 10 or 15 years ago, there wasn't a single government that actually questioned climate science. I remember being in um, Valencia, Spain for uh, an important conference uh, that where the new IPCC report was released. Um, that was in 2007. Not even the Saudi Arabian government disputed the realities of climate change or the fact that it is uh, uh, caused by uh, human activities. Um, all of these things are completely accepted in the government realm because they know that the science is very solid about it. And yet you step out of those professional circles and you pick up the New York Times or any other newspapers and then you start reading about climate uncertainty or climate skeptics or debates and parallel universe. 
and and the obvious question is you know if saudi arabia or the government of george w bush does not dispute climate science you know why would anybody in society you know claim that we don't know enough about uh, climate change or what's causing it it's just it's just a very striking contrast Thank you. Um, I have a question. Uh, given that you've uh, participated uh, in these various important uh, uh, conferences, um, would you say that uh, it is economics that basically drives the desire to take initiative in, in uh, trying to do something about uh, climate change? That's a great question. Um, um, my personal view is that uh, there are multiple drivers of this process uh, because it's a very multidimensional process of transformation towards a clean economy. And it is economic considerations, economic interests, but it is also public awareness, public alarm, public pressure on governments to take action. Uh, genuine concern by governments, you know, who are trying to uh, take care of the problem. Um, it is um, multiple factors that explain it. However, I do think that the, the economic arguments for climate policy were the key trigger point that helps explain that remarkable change of hearts over the last 10 or 15 years. Because for decades, you know, when people, when leaders believed that climate policy is just too expensive, um, no amount of public concern or awareness would have changed economic planning. But when the Europeans and the Koreans came and said, wait, wait a second, we need to look at the numbers again, we're seeing actually major economic interests and benefit economic benefits in emission reductions. That is when people started paying real attention. Right, And because the information that those governments provided was eventually massive and compelling, therefore credible, uh, I do think that the economic rationale um, is really, has really played a central role. Thank you, that's very helpful. Um, I think we are almost at the top of the hour. Uh, and I don't see any other questions. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Dimitrov, for your uh, presentation and for joining us today. And we wish you all the best. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you for organizing the conference. So now we are uh, taking another uh, break. And uh, I will uh, start immediately after 15 minutes. Uh, with our next speaker, and uh, I hope that you will all be on time for our next speaker. Thank you very much. Join us in 15 minutes, please. <laughs>